This morning we look, in, look at our second lesson with the idea of haunted. Uh, last week we looked at the idea of how we can be haunted by regret. And today we're looking at how we can be haunted by fear. Have you ever been afraid to do something? One of my first and probably the clearest story I can remember or my, my clearest experience of fear comes from when I was a teenager. Uh, let me say this first. I don't endorse going to water parks anymore, but I was a young man, a teenager, so we did those things. Long before, I can't remember the church, but I can remember going when I was younger to a water park, and we would go, it seemed like, almost every day with one of my friends. And so we'd go, we ride to various rides and do different things, and one day we one of our friends from school who actually happened to be a uh, defensive lineman from the school where we attended. And he was there and he was quite a large guy, muscular guy, and he went around with us doing different things. He said, let's go on this ride over here. Well, I wasn't really all that excited about it. We went over to where it, to where it was and walked up the six flights of stairs and stood at the top and I remember very vividly my fear of heights. And this ride, as they call it, had just enough, what it was, was really just a large slide, had just enough slope or wasn't straight down. And what they would have you do, you would sit down, lean back, and you cross your arms, and the lifeguard would grab your arms and just nudge you over the side. And I can remember doing that, and I remember going the whole way down thinking to myself, don't die, don't die, don't die, because that's my thoughts. Because I had a fear of heights, and I still do. But as you hit the water, the three feet of water you skid into, I was thankful that I survived. But you think about fear, it's something that's very real for everyone. There are various things in life that scare us. Some things scare us a lot more than others. But fear, like many other things, can be overcome if we, someone sometimes will just give us a little nudge to get us going. We think about fear in the Bible. We know the Bible speaks of fear, how the world causes us great grief, and sometimes we fear the persecution. Sometimes we fear the comments and the mockings of others. But have we ever been afraid of failure? When I was younger in high school, we had a class called public speaking. I hated that class. I remember the things you have to prepare in the speeches, and now, of course, it seems a little ironic consider what I do, but at that time, I despised it. I, the idea of getting up before people, my hands would shake, my knees would shake, and it was all I'd do to get, to get through it. But fear can be overcome no matter what it is, and it takes many, many uh, images before us. But this morning we want to look at how fear can prevent the Christian from growth and from service. Did you ever think about that, how fear can keep us from growing and from serving God? What about a fear of a role in a worship assembly? I can remember a gentleman in South Carolina who had a great fear of speaking in front of people. He had all his prayers written down on a note card, which was just fine. But if his name wasn't down beforehand, if you called him suddenly, he would he'd scare him to death. And so he had a great fear of serving. Now, he did all he could to overcome that. But there are those who have this fear of serving in a public way to the point they will not do it. Too many fear a public role in worship, and of course, some, some do not fear. They just have no interest in it. If you remember Moses in Exodus chapter 4, when God called him to do the work of his work. How Moses in chapter 4 began to make excuses. And he gives one after another. But Moses, eventually his true feelings came out in Exodus 4 and verse 13. When he said, Oh my Lord, please send by the hand whoever else you may send. Moses, no doubt, had a fear of leading the people. By his way of saying he didn't have a, he was an eloquent man, he may have had a fear of speaking before others. And on and on it goes. We continue to read though in Exodus 4 that God basically tells him, Aaron will be your speaker. I'll tell you what, what he should say and you tell Aaron, but you're still going to serve me. So even with his excuses and with his fear, 
he did not get out of serving God. In fact, you think about Moses, he's probably the most well-known Old Testament character, isn't he? We all know about Moses. When serving in the public assembly, we should strive to replace fear with honor. One of the reasons I went out when I was in preaching school, went out every weekend, it seemed like every weekend anyway, was to improve. I wanted to get used to being in front of people. It's something that still today you get a little bit anxious before you stand up for a group of people, but you want to do it over and over and over again because you want to get used to it. You want to get used to the nervousness, get used to a little bit of fear that's there, but you want to get used to it and to eventually overcome it and to be able to do what you want and what you need to do. Some fear because they maybe, when they, if they serve, they fear that maybe they won't do a good job. I'm convinced if you talk to a group of, a congregation of men and ask them who are willing to lead prayers, I'm sure all of them will not raise their hands. There will be some who are a little bit afraid to do so. Maybe because they have a fear of speaking, maybe because they're not sure exactly what to say or they don't want to say something wrong. And so this fear keeps them from doing something they could be doing. Still, some fear because of, of being almost required to serve. Do you know there are those in the world today who would choose a larger congregation over a smaller one? And not because one is scriptural and one is not. But there are those who attend a larger congregation because they feel they will be asked to do a whole lot less. Maybe they won't be asked at all. Whereas a congregation about our size, the men, many times we ask if you're willing to do so, to serve in various ways. But you know, in larger congregations, a lot of times that can be avoided. And so sometimes you have those who will prefer a larger congregation over a smaller one because perhaps they'll be asked not, they won't be asked to do anything. Yet we still have those who, because of fear, they not only fear of having a role in the worship assembly, but maybe, maybe they also fear, have a fear of teaching publicly or privately. Some have a fear of teaching. Sometimes this is a, a confidence issue. Many knowledgeable people, however, sometimes sit idle because of fear. You know, it's interesting that sometimes we talk to people, they think you have to be a, a great, outstanding speaker, be able to convey your thoughts and things. There's a man by the name of Robert Taylor who has written many commentaries and spoke numerous times. But if you ever heard him speak, he's kind of like Ben Stein. It's very monotone. And unless you're interested, you're probably going to fall asleep during his lesson. But if you listen to him and listen to what he says, you'll notice that you're not bored at all. But you notice he is, doesn't have to be the greatest speaker in the world, the greatest presenter of a lesson, because, to be honest, he's really not. But his material is, is, are things that will just blow you away coming from the Word of God. And so we shouldn't fear the idea that we have to be a great, tremendous presenter of a lesson of material because we don't have to be. Moses wasn't. He, he was afraid, but he still served God in various areas. Some, however, sit idle because of the ignorance of the Scriptures. But you know both of these can be changed. Look at Deuteronomy 3 and verse 27. We see that we are to encourage those who are to be leaders. Being a leader in a congregation, really in any area of life, can be very scary because you have people looking up to you, looking for an answer, looking for some way to handle a situation. In Deuteronomy 3, verse 27, the Bible says, Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over the, this Jordan. Now, this being spoken there to Moses because he disobeyed God, didn't do exactly as God told him to do, and so he went across over. But notice what God does tell him to do in verse 28. But command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go, go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. Why does he need to encourage him? Why does he need to strengthen him? Because no doubt Joshua is probably a little bit nervous. You remember how large a group of the people of Israel are? Millions of people. Could you imagine leading the nation across an area to a, another area and trying to maintain a leadership position and keep things orderly? That is a very difficult and no doubt a very stressful position to be in. And so rightfully so, I'm sure Joshua is probably at least a little bit 
afraid. But you notice that he is to be encouraged to overcome any fear that may keep him from serving God to the best of his ability. He says, command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. You know how you can <clears throat> encourage people today, not just by telling them they're doing a good job, but also saying, you can handle this. You're doing a good job. Keep doing what you're doing. But also, we can also offer our aid. We can offer to help them in smaller areas and allow ourselves to also serve. But we see here with Moses, he wasn't going to be able to go over with Joshua. But he's encouraging him and he's instructing him, saying, you can do this. You can lead these people and do what God wants you to do and what God needs you to do. And so we can encourage those to be leaders. We also can encourage one another to grow. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So we see that fear can be overcome by others encouraging us and helping us, and by also many times by repetition. But also the fear because we, don't have, a lack, we have a lack of knowledge, it also can be overcome. And so when you think about it in this way, there really is no reason why we cannot do what we need to do for the Lord today. As you think about this, how fear prevents the Christian from growth and from service, fear can also disqualify the Christian. Do you think about that? If we fear doing certain things, we disqualify ourselves from being a servant for God in various different ways. One of those ways is we can disqualify ourselves from being a leader. We can disqualify ourselves from being qualified to be an elder if you're a man. 1 Timothy 3 verse 2 says, able to teach means you can't be an elder if you're too afraid to get up and stand up and talk to people and present a lesson, present a Bible class. Able to teach. We also notice Titus 1 verses 10 through 14. It says, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. What is he talking about? Elders, leaders really in general, have to be willing to stand up for what is right. We know fear can keep people from doing that. We know this because how many times hear people say, well, no, they said it wasn't exactly right, but it's not that big of a deal. Well, yes, it is. Too many people have gone unnoticed because of the fear of speaking up and saying something. The fear of saying, well, you know, the Bible actually says here in this verse, in this chapter, something contrary to what you just said. Because you notice here in Titus 1, verse 14, what happens when we do not, when we go and follow after fables and traditions? He says in verse 14, giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who what? Who turn from the truth. Now we know we cannot get into eternal life if we're following after the traditions of men and the commandments of men and the fables that we hear. These Jewish fables, I think about today, we could put that in line with the idea of all these false ideas that men are trying to put out there today. Once saved, always saved. Well, that sounds great, but you know that's not accurate. Just believe on Christ, that's all you have to do. Faith only, well that sounds great, because it sounds so simple. But that's not accurate, is it? We think about, <clears throat> excuse me, how fear can, how if one can overcome his fear to teach, he cannot serve as an elder because an elder has to be brave enough to do those things which are difficult. But you know, it's not just an elder, it's not just a deacon, it's not just the preacher. But members ourselves, me being a member here, my, myself included, have to be willing to stand up and say something when error is being presented. And when we see it, because if we don't, what's going to happen is we're going to, we may <clears throat> grow to the point where we're now going to accept it, but also those who come after us are going to accept it. You know, too many people have been led down the path of false teaching, 
because their parents before them didn't say anything. You know, that's sad, isn't it? But one of the reasons I think sometimes that we don't say anything is because, like I mentioned before, we don't know enough about the Bible to recognize it. And we should not be afraid to speak up about these things because we have to remember all these things of our eternal consequence. If we follow false doctrine, we're not going to go into heaven, are we? That's just how it is. How sad it would be for a godly man to be disqualified because of fear. So we can, be, we can be disqualified from being a leader, but we can also be disqualified from being called faithful. How many times do we know those who, they, they, they profess to be a Christian, but someone makes a little comment or invites them to something, they agree to go to it or go along with it. They quickly change their views. The fear of ridicule from others is enough to cause some to become unfaithful. Oftentimes, a quick change of view or a sudden disinterest is a result of the fear of ridicule from others. Do you like to have someone disagree with you and make fun of you about something you believe? Now, I think for most of our, a lot of us here, we have such strong fellowship with one another that may not happen very often, if ever, because we're always around one another. But you step out in the world, make a trip to the store, there's no telling what you're going to hear. You cannot go, I have, I've gone into gas stations and different businesses and hear conversations that people are having about their personal life. And of course, you don't try to butt in. I don't mean to hear what they're saying, but they're talking so loud and hear me across the store, you're going to hear it anyway. And you think, boy, this world needs to change its thinking. But if we were to stand up and say something against it, they would probably ridicule us, wouldn't they? Just the other day, Brother Tony Brewer, you may remember, was here a few weeks ago, posted something on Facebook on one of their pages, and Facebook took it down, called it hate speech, because he quoted scripture condemning homosexual lifestyles. You know, those things are just going to increase more and more. Well, we cannot speak where the Bible speaks publicly, because now it's hate speech. But we can bash Christians all day long, can't we? Notice, if you will, John 12, 42 and 43. It says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They said, We believe in God, but everybody else here hates him, so we're not going to say a word about it. We're not going to say a word about it. Verse, 20, verse 43 says, For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. This type of fear is more than just fear. It's a weakness of the person. And sometimes, I think we can look upon it as a flaw in their character. If you change your mind because someone makes fun of you, and all that, all, that's all it takes for you to change your mind, that's pretty weak, isn't it? You know, people can bash the Bible all they want. They're going to do a lot more than that to change my mind to stop believing in it. There are those who point to videos and all kinds of little commentaries and books to try to disprove the Bible. And they mock us on television, on the news, newspapers, whatever. But the fearful, the weak, will see those things and say, oh, they're, they're attacking my beliefs. I'm going to change and just do whatever they're doing. Isn't that a flaw in that person's character as well? If you change, they change their mind right away. Could you imagine going overseas with someone to do a trip, do a mission trip of some type, and the first time they meet someone who's opposed to them, they change their mind and start teaching something else. You're going to say, it's time for you to go home, isn't it? Because you don't want that person there. Who wants to be friends with someone who believes one thing until someone mocks them for it and then changes their mind or beliefs? We should be strong enough... <clears throat> to thank for ourselves and to stand our ground. Consider Proverbs 25 and verse 26. A righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and a polluted well. What do you do? You stay away from it. You have no use for him, do you? No one goes to a polluted well or nasty well or, or, a, or a murky spring and gets a drink of water because it's not going to do you any good. It's going to hurt you. The same idea he says here with the righteous man who falters before the wicked. They're righteous until someone says something to them, and then they just kind of shrivel away. So fear prevents the Christian 
<coughs> excuse me, from growth and from service. Fear can disqualify the Christian. But fear also has <coughs> its proper place. You know, the fear of hell shall, should drive the Christian. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Why do we persuade men? Because hell is real. And heaven is real. And because we fear that anyone may go there, we try our very best to teach them and show them the truth of the gospel. Fear can be used to propel us in the right direction, can it? The fear of hell should drive us to talk to others. The fear of hell should drive, to, should drive us to defend our beliefs. And the fear of hell should drive you to ignore those who would mock you. Proverbs 12 and verse 26 says, A righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. You know, sometimes it's those around us who mock us. Now, for some of us, like I said before, we're around one another, and so we're kind of, you might say, have a safe, safe net of friends. You aren't going to be one of those who mock us. But if you're in the workplace, or if you go out and do other events, or active in the, in the community, you have those around you who want to be your friends and want to be your acquaintance, and would also like to, if you're willing, to lead you down a different path than one you're on. He says, the righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way the wicked leads one astray, leads them astray. Fear is something that can hinder us and keep us away from Christ. You know, fear, we sometimes fear, especially like guys, we don't look like we're strong and tough all the time, right? So we fear that we're going to look weak at any given point. We don't want to look weak before anyone else, do we? And so, so many times we have those who, out of fear, Though they may be doing error and doing sin, will never humble themselves before a God and change whatever sin is in their life and remove it. And you know, it goes both ways, not just for men, but also for ladies, for everyone. We don't want to look like we're just an awful person. For some reason, I think we have built up into our minds that if we have ever done something wrong and we repent of it, they rise and look down upon us. You know, that's not accurate, is it? In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to, as God forgives us, we are to forgive those who have sinned against us as well, if they have sinned against us. And if they haven't, if someone has been repenting of their sins, why would we want to hold that against them? Why would we want to hang on to that? I don't, I've never understood that. But fear of those types of responses sometimes keep us from doing that which is right. As we close this morning, why allow fear to hinder you because it can keep us from doing a lot of things you know fear could have kept me from doing well in a speech class somehow I passed it fear could have kept me from going down that giant slide which I feared you know what's interesting about both of those things as time went on I enjoyed it more and more I came down that slide of 60 feet came down I felt like I want to kiss the ground but well, then went right back up and did it again because it wasn't so scary the second time. And so if we will just conquer our fears once and do what is necessary to overcome our fears, we can do it again and again and again. And when we overcome our fears, we can serve God better, we can learn more about Him and do all we can for God when we overcome the fear that can hinder us from doing what we should be doing and could be doing for Christ. We should fear God and not the world. Matthew 10 and verse 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, the world can only do so much in reality to you. They can say things, but in all reality, who really cares what the world says about us anyway? I never said for some reason why the world holds so much stock in the people of Hollywood. Because you find some of the biggest freaks in Hollywood throughout the whole world. They're right there in Los Angeles, aren't they? Or in New York or whatever. They're in Hollywood. That's where you find some of the biggest freak shows you've ever seen who live in sinful ways and do things that they shouldn't. And yet they want to say that they are the right way and that we are the wrong way. And that we're foolish and ignorant for not doing things as they do. 
You know, sometimes we need to realize that those who would have you feel bad are those we should ignore and move on. As you think about these things this morning, we do not want to allow fear to hinder us. We want to overcome fear. We want to do all we can to serve God. We want to have fear have its proper place to fear God, but not to fear man. And we should not fear serving God, but we should fear not serving Him. You know, as a Christian, we know that sometimes it's difficult to do something we've never done before. But if we're willing, and if it's needed, you know, we say the, we say the line so many times, if, we're, there's, if we have the ability, we have the responsibility to do something. Fear should not be something that keeps us from serving God. We can make the proper changes and do what is necessary to serve Him in any way that we, He needs us to serve Him, whether in our community or out in the, or in the local congregation as well. This morning, as you think about these things, you think about how fear can affect a Christian. If you need to ask for forgiveness of sins, ask for, for encouragement, we'd love to pray on your behalf. Whatever your need may, may, may be, you can come forward now. That's going to be saying, sing to encourage you.